Okay. All right. So let me close this. Yeah. All right. So that's the thing, but that's about externalities. As much as I want to say about externalities and increasing return, I don't think it's <coughs> very interesting. There's a more important thing that has been going on in the debate for 15, 20 years. And it has to do with the following observation, right? Remember the way we described things before, right? We said, well, basically, when I did, you know, solo in a modern version, walking through rays, right? That was my story, right? That was the description. Here, for a number of periods, from period t equals zero to period t equal t1, I'm accumulating capital stock, right? In fact, in my graph before, I'm accumulating capital stock here. This is where labor is at time one, right? And capital instead grows here, and so production grows here, right? And in that period, capital stock divided labor as a certain ratio, call it gamma one, right? Once we get here, labor is fully employed, and even if it is growing a bit, slowly, right? Uh, it's too expensive. So the process of substitution changes. What does that mean? What does that mean? I'm using a certain machine, machine of type 1 with a ratio k1. So this is actually machine of type 1 during these periods, right? Let's take t away, doesn't matter, right? And the ratio there is gamma 1. And I use it for all these periods between t equals 0 and t1. T1 is that period at which I have full employment using that technology. And I'm not, I cannot expand output anymore. Because if I build more machines of that type, I don't have workers. So the only thing I do by using, by producing more machine of that type is creating factories that go broke. Right? In fact, one way of thinking of that, my way of thinking at what people call shake out, or moments in which a certain developing industry has a crisis, is exactly this. During this period, this technology is very good in making profits. So everybody accumulates, and not people that may have rational expectation, but that doesn't mean they're perfect. Right? Accumulating that means lots of us are building up productive capacity we may end up producing too much. We may end up having too many firms of that type. We may end up having too much productive capacity of type one. At that point, our demand for labor or for other factor exceed current supply, and therefore we force prices very high, right? Prices of some factor of production goes very high. They go so high for some of them, for some of us, I'm sorry, that we make losses and we shut down, right? So this is the period in which there is that thing. Now, what happens during this period? During this period is some of us say, I cannot continue growing and making profits with that technology. I have to invent something else. So some of us invest resources to try to do that. There are many ways of doing that. We can do by intuition, we can do by trial and error, we can do by asking our workers to provide suggestion, we can do by research and development, 
many ways. Historically, there have been many ways. The thing called research and development, organized research and development, is very recent. Right? Ford didn't do research and development. Well, he did research and development, it was just called it differently. Edison did research and development. All these people did research and development. Anybody that has come up with a new way of doing things has done research and development. You know, you try out and you make a, a prototype and you see if it works in a way or another. All right? So, what is this? This means that I am trying to build up new ideas. The reason why I do this like that is why? It's because mathematically, it's hard to describe a continuum of ideas, right? So I am actually going from this type of ray to that type of ray with a different gamma. But in fact, typically, I'm going in little steps. This is not always true. Sometimes you go in big steps. Sometimes you go from the car to the car, right? There is no intermediate thing with a little microscopic engine, right? Eventually. You know, the cart with the horses, and people say, well, let's take that cart and put an engine, because we invented the engine in other applications, and it seems to be working. If you think, the very first car is a cart with an engine, but it's a discrete jump, right? So here, the thing I want to I, I stress is that this thing, in order to be produced, so that I can have capital of type 2 now employing labor at a ratio gamma 2, what makes these two things different is that they embody different ideas, right? So we start talking about ideas as a factor of production, knowledge. We can give it many names. The word ideas has become fashionable because it's short and it gives this sense of great ideas, right? But it's a lot of little things, in fact. You know, equations, prototypes, knowledge about materials, you know, lots of little things together that make the thing called idea. You know, think of the engine, you know. So what is that we have to observe? We have to observe two things. Yes, this is discre discreetly different from that. Mm -hmm. A car is discreetly different from a cart. Mm -hmm. It's a cart with an engine. And that idea, putting the two together and finding a way of having the energy produced by the and the energy produced by the engine transmitted to the wheels of the car requires mechanical arrangements that are different from the way in which the horse transmitted the energy. The horse just pulled and the, and the wheel went. Instead, with the engine, it's the engine that makes the, the wheel rotates, you know, going yeah. vertical and then horizontal and then right. In fact, the transmission is the key thing. Finding the the gears that allows you the transmission and make them go without breaking everything <laughs> is, is what allows you to put the two things together. Okay? Uh, and so what is that we have to observe? We have to observe that it's different, but we also have to observe that in these simplified words, it must be that this is producible for that. Right? Maybe in intermediate stages, which is why I have this isoquant, Right? So in my formalism, I pretend it's just one step. In practice, it's 72 steps. But there's got to be a sequence of steps from which the technology number one uses inputs that exist to produce the technology number two. The technology number two does not come from the sky like mana all set up. Okay? When in China you started to build factories that use modern equipment, you imported some of the inputs from outside, and part of it you produce yourself, which meant the technology you had then embodied in you and in your factories was able to produce the new technology. Right? When now some people here in the building where we are with the institute, that is full of electronics, machine sensory, all kinds of super advanced labs, when people in those labs produce a new, you know, uh, touch phone device, eh, they are doing it with something that already exists. Again, this is no economics. It's a fact that it seems that nature is such that it allows us to produce new tools with old tools. 
the first tool was, according to mythology, a stone or a bone. We produced that with our hands. Right? Then from the stone and the bone, we produced a, a piece of wood with the stone attached to it. And then from that, we started making it better. Then we found you know, bronze and said, oh, let's forge bronze and make a sword made of bronze. Right? Something like that. Right. Point is, inputs of the old technology must absolutely be able to produce inputs of the new technology because otherwise there is a miracle every time. And, you know, explaining economic growth with the arrival of God every two and two, you know, it's not that interesting. <laughs> also because then people start debating which God. And then, you know, oh, my God is better than yours. My God made more invention than yours. No, 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 no. Let's leave God outside. Okay, so we leave the gods and the spirits outside, and we have to conclude that there has to be a way of producing new inputs from old inputs. So there has to be, in the language of our first lecture, an activity or a sequence of activities from which you start from the existing technology and produce the new one. Obviously, in the middle, you need the idea. And so here comes the big debate. And you may know. And the fundamental paper here is Ken Arrow. There's a fundamental paper by Ken Arrow written in 1962. I will not discuss the backstage of that paper, elaboration, which I learned directly from Arrow, with whom I was lucky enough to entertain long conversation, collaboration, many years during the Santa Fe Institute period between 1986 and 1998, when I stopped going. Okay? Because it would be Maybe on one day I write it, and I think I have even his email about that, about the history of economic and how, what motivates what. But anyhow, in that paper, which has, contains a lot of fundamental contribution about essentially private information and so on, uh, Kane also talks about ideas in the sense of innovation mm -hmm. and says something of which he later repented. And in fact, the paper is very ambiguous. He says, ideas and innovation are public goods. In fact, he reaches the conclusion that we should finance the NSF. Okay, because it's a public good. And so new ideas are public good, and as such, we should treat them as public good and finance them with public funds. I beg to disagree. I always did <laughs> with the author of the idea. I think the author of idea eventually changed his mind, but that's another story. But I want to try to convince you that useful economic ideas are not a public good at all. In fact, they are the most private, rivalrous, and excludable good that there is. If I did not want to teach you this today, you would have never learned. If I had not told you or had decided to tell you that Ken Arrow wrote this and that for this and that reason, which is an idea, you would have not known it. Or, in order to know it, to know it, you would have to discover yourself. Which in the case of Ken, unfortunately, is impossible because he unfortunately <coughs> passed away last year, I think, or the year before. Okay? In general. So what does it mean to say, let's say, what is a public good? A public good, especially in the way in which it is treated in the growth model, but in theory, is a good that we can all use without reducing the marginal utility or the marginal productivity, if it is an input, that other people receive from that good and that cannot be voluntarily excluded. That's a public good. Right? In fact, pure public goods are very rare, yeah. as we know. There's been a lot of rhetorical thing about education being a public good, but it's not at all. Look at this, right? Pure public goods are very rare good. Many people got fascinated by the fact that ideas, invention, that thing you need to figure out with this to produce that, is a public good. Because they are non-excludable and non-rivalous, in particular non-rivalous. I claim 
That's a gigantic mistake. Do you, do you guys know this story? Have you ever thought about this? Has this, this ever been debated in other classes? What's the idea that allows you to go from K1 to K2? Notice that for a, a, something to be a public good, I must be able to acquire it at no cost, mm -hmm. at no extra cost, okay? In particular, no extra private cost. Right? The technology, it's a, it's a feature of the technology that this is so. So, you all know Pythagoras theorem, right? Do you know Pythagoras theorem? This. Yeah. I'm sure you do. It's just oh, you probably exactly. pronounce yeah. the word differently. The square here. Yeah. And that's Pythagoras theorem. It's a very old finding. Right? Yeah. Pythagoras was a guy, apparently, that lived in a Greek colony in southern Italy, in Sicily, in fact, if I recall correctly, but I'm not even sure. Maybe it was Calabria. Yeah, in Chinese Forgot. history, we call it Gokudini. We thought this is older, some uh, Chinese find them. Obviously, we must have a Chinese <laughs> guy. You know, in China, everything was invented first. <laughs> I know. Even spaghetti. <laughs> not to speak of pizza. <laughs> Very good. So, how do you call it? Gokudini. That is kind of like a folk theorem. Uh, Folk theory. Go. <laughs> it's, it's another name, but Whatever. it's another, yeah. That theorem. Yeah, yeah. It's good, because that's a fantastic example. So first of all, maybe the theorem in question, theorem X, which is extremely useful. Once you know it, you can do a lot of things in construction, lots of stuff. So it's a very <coughs> useful, productive idea. All ideas, in some sense, are productive, but, you know, from the idea of magician, best you make some movies or some fantasies. From the Pythagoras or the, you know, the, 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 the square triangle rules, you can make a lot of useful things like buildings, right? Um, so interestingly enough, first of all, it was invented at least by two independent people somewhere. Problem is that the idea in the sense that it was river, that it's, or no, it's not river, it existed before these two guys. Right? Imagine. Why? Because they both invented it independently. If I consume this, if I use this, you cannot simultaneously use this. That's why this is river. If Young's drinks his cup of coffee, I cannot drink his cup of coffee. That's why it's rivers. But if both of us can simultaneously produce the same idea for the first time, something here is no rivers. Eh? But on the other end, something here requires effort. So what is that it was no rivers? Well, the abstract idea is no rivers. It's a very particular aspect of knowledge. It's certainly a, a feature of knowledge. Things can be learned by many people, in fact, by an infinite number of people, potentially. On the other end, learning this is not free. Even if X figures it out, for you to learn it, you have to make some effort. So it's important to distinguish between the abstract idea that can be learned by anybody and the copy of the idea, the one that you know, you know, you know, you know, I know, he knows. Those copies are costly and they're not public good at all. They're not public good at all. They're very rivalrous. 
right? I use my idea, he uses his idea. There's no way he can use my idea until I teach him that is, we make a copy. And that copy becomes his. And there's no way I can use his model until I learn the model. That is, he teaches me the model or through the paper that he wrote, I learn the model and I invest time and resource and make a copy in my brain. That's something we have to observe. So one, when one talks about ideas, one has to be very careful. What ideas are you talking about? Are you talking the abstract idea that potentially can be discovered? Or are you talking the actual idea that has been discovered and of which there are 622 copies? Right? When I make a new variety of rice by inbreeding existing variety of rices in a lab and by treating them with genetic modification, right? What I'm doing is existing 